We'll be starting with John chapter 2, verses 11 to 25, and then we'll be turning our Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 25 to 31. But firstly, we will start with John chapter 11. John chapter 2, verse 11. If you don't have a Bible on you today, the screen behind me will, f- will have the verses that we'll be reading from. And John chapter 2, verse 11 reads, This beginning of miracles the Jesus of Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found a temple, those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an household of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou dost these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple. In three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the body, he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and that they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, please turn your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 16. We'll be starting with verse 25. Once again, that is the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 25. Once again, if you do not have a Bible on you, the the reading will be on the screen behind me. Starting with the book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 25. And it reads, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all of the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosened, and the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword, and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Please be seated, as Pastor Chan will come and deliver the message. I want to share with you tonight such profound messages and illumination that God has given me as I prepared for this message. So profound that it has transformed my entire thinking on what God desires for each one of us. I never knew this before. I want to share that with you. This evening, I want to tell you what the Lord Jesus himself will show to us what real relationships are all about and what they are not. This is something 
of course, we can all relate to and is so relevant to all of our lives is what we want in a relationship. And it's not any different between us and Jesus. And in the process, Jesus will demystify for us and make clear to all of us what it is to become a real Christian without using any of the Christian evangelical jargon that we so, are you so used to using, which often does not reflect the essence of what Jesus is truly seeking for us to have with him. Please stand as we turn again in the word of God to John chapter 2 as I read verses 23 to 25. John chapter 2 verses 23 to 25. If you don't have your Bible uh, with you, that's fine. Look at the screen behind me. Now when he, Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and he did not that any should testify of men, to tell him of man, for he knew what was in man. All right, you may be seated and close your Bible. In John chapter 2, which Brother Fari read, we saw, we read, that Jesus performed three different signs in three different settings. The marriage at Cana of Galilee, where he turned water to wine. His display, his sign of the zeal of his house consuming him when he drove out the money changers and throughout their temple. And the Jews themselves says, can you give us another sign? So they actually defined for us that it was a sign, but they weren't impressed with that sign. They wanted another sign. And then the third is in this passage we just read. It says when Jesus was at the feast, the Passover, that he did many signs, and in this case, miracles. In our use of the Bible language, we often say signs and wonders. In the Greek, signs is samian. Wonders is, is a similar word. But basically, it talks about evidence for what is God, a miracle from God, and wonders that only God can do. Both are miracles, but they have a different word. So three signs in chapter 2, in three different settings. And the result of the signs that he did in these verses, chapter 2, verse 23 to 25, as a result of his miracles, his signs, many believed in his name. Very important. So Jesus himself will interpret what John meant by those words. Many believed in his name. So our text, which we shall explore more deeply, is a little bit of an abbreviation of what we just read. It's on the screen. Just for conciseness, taking off some of the extra words. Many believed in Jesus' name when they saw the miracles, the signs. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, those who were believed in his name because of the miracles, because he knew what was in man. So I have three points tonight, simple points. First, it is not enough to believe in Jesus' name to be saved. Let me say that again. It's not enough to believe in Jesus' name to be saved. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles. Now let me be clear. The word here, believed, is the word that we often use. And I'll just tell you, because many people know it, it's the Greek word pisteo. It's a verb to believe. And it's used in hundreds, maybe hundreds of times, in the New Testament for real faith and belief in Jesus that saves. So it is used in a way that describes salvation, but not here. Let me explain. They believed, but they were not saved. So it's important that we understand that in order to be saved, what or who we believe in must be the object of our salvation who can save. That's very important. The belief that they had was genuine. They believed 
that Jesus can do miracles. They believed in a miracle worker. But that does not save. So, believed, it's a bona fide Greek word that is associated with salvation. But the object of our belief must be the one who saves. Jesus Christ, Lord of all. Very important. Now, the clearest example of real belief that doesn't save is found in James chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. They had real pastoral, real faith. But the object of their faith was God. And God doesn't save. Jesus saves. So we have to understand that we must have faith. We must truly believe. But the object the person in whom we believe must be Jesus. And we know that. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him, but by Jesus. So we knew that. But we have to be precise in understanding this. So in that passage in James, the word believest, thou believest in God, Okay, thou doest well. The devils also believe. Those two words that we use as translate, believest, thou believest in God, and thou and the devils also believe. Those two words are also pistol. So precisely what I'm saying. They had real belief, but it was in God. And it's good. It's good to believe in God. Jesus said so. You believe in God, believe also in me. It's a beginning. If you truly believe in God who can do miracles and you want God in your life. That's a tremendous beginning and a gift from God. I am not minimizing that, but it's insufficient for salvation. So these Jews who just believe in God were not saved. We must understand that the meaning of the word must consider the context in which it is used. So important. And in our present passage from verse 22 to 25, there are two main contextual considerations. In other words, things in the context that will help us to understand what exactly did these people believe and why weren't they saved. First, we must see that they believed as a direct result of seeing miracles. That's what it says. They believed on him because of the miracles that they saw. That's important. They didn't believe because they needed a sin bearer. You see what I'm saying? They believed truly in a miracle worker. They didn't believe in Jesus the Savior because they weren't convinced that they needed a Savior. They wanted to see a miracle worker and, and they were enamored. They were very impressed with a miracle worker. But there are other miracle workers in the Bible other than Jesus that don't save. That's very important we understand that. So one is the context that they believe because as a direct result of them seeing miracles. Again, not because they needed a Savior. And secondly, it says they believed in Jesus' name. And we're going to go into that a little bit deeper so we can understand that. Earlier in this chapter of John chapter 2 that Fari read, the first verse he read, John's word comments on Jesus' first miracle at the marriage of Canaan and Galilee, and that's John 2.11. Let's look at that. This beginning of miracles, this first miracle, did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Same issue that the disciples believed on him when they saw that first miracle. Same subject. In fact, let me just say this, going fast forward a little bit. Many people believe, and I believe too, that chapter 2, verse 22, when it starts to talk about miracles that, his, that other people saw at the Passover, should begin chapter 3. And why is that? Because if you know your Bible, and I'll just tell you, there was a man sent from God. Right? I'm going to fast forward. And what did he say? To Jesus, we know that that we know that you are a man come from God because no man can do these miracles except God be with him. Same subject from what Fari read 
in early in the chapter. So if we're talking about the same theme about belief because of miracles. Even Nicodemus himself came to Jesus because he was one of them that was convinced that Jesus could do miracles. Amen. But we know he wasn't saved because Jesus told him, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And in, in John 3, 7, he said explicitly, you must be born again. Yet he was a miracle believer. So all through this passage, very clear, they believed in the miracle worker, but they were not saved. Very important. But let's look at another example. And I'm, I went ahead of myself. I'll go over, go over this again. It's okay. John 3, 2. This is the word of Nicodemus. I want to get it, grill it in our minds. This is what Nicodemus said. I'll do the full thing. Rabbi, or teacher, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. So clearly... Nicodemus was persuaded he was a miracle worker, and as I've said, he wasn't saved. But let's look at even more verses. Let's look at later on in the gospel in John 7.31. I want to impress on you that merely believing on Jesus' name, merely believing that he's a miracle worker is not sufficient for salvation. We have to dig deeper into the word of God for us to see this. So John 7.31. And many of the people believed on him, and said, when Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man had done? So let us observe that these people were impressed that Jesus did miracles. But they were also filled with doubt. Shouldn't the Messiah do even more miracles than this? Yes, he's a miracle worker. He's special. But shouldn't the Messiah do even more? So there's a gradation even within those who believe that Jesus could do miracles. There's those who really, really believe he can do miracles, and those, yeah, I think he does can do miracles, but I'm not sure he's really the Messiah, because shouldn't he do more? So I'm showing you that there is a range of belief. That's very important that we understand that. Now let's look at the second the second context, remember I told you there is two contexts for us to understand belief. The first one is belief because he does miracles. The second one is belief in his name. Now this phrase, to believe in Jesus' name, is particular, is only occurs in the Gospel of John. John 1.12, and we find it twice in the Gospel of John, once in one of his epistles. In John 1.12, John says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Observe, we see believe on his name, but it's, it occurs alongside another clear method to be saved, to receive him. This doesn't mean that to believe on his name doesn't save, but because we know receiving him saves, there is, at minimum, a redundancy of ways to be saved. But let's look at more. Let's look at John 20, 31. I've mentioned this passage many times. This is the purpose of John writing the Gospel of John. John 20, 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life. How? Through his name. Here again we find two methods of salvation juxtaposed right next to each other. Amen. To believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, is the purpose of the Gospel of John, and that saves. To believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, that will save you. But we have the addition, believing on his name. Just keep that in mind. All right, now let's look to the epistle of 1 John, same author, Apostle John, I mentioned that this is particular. Believing in his name is particular to the Apostle John, twice in the Gospel of John, once in the Epistle. So let's look at that. And this is his commandment, that ye should believe on the name of his Son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now, who can love one another? Who has real agape love? 
Well, John says in his gospel, by this shall all men know you are my disciples, that you're real Christians if you have love one to another. So again, we see a two methods of salvation alongside believing on Jesus' name. This is not to say that believing on Jesus' name will not save you. It's not, I'm not saying that. But it is, when it occurs, and it only calls these three times in the Bible and our passage, when it occurs, there is also another way with which to be saved. So keep that in mind. Just keep that in mind. Now let's look at just one more reason why belief or faith in Christ may not result in true salvation. Just follow me, and, and I will bring the verse that everyone's thinking about. Let's look at one more reason why just faith or belief alone may, may not result in true salvation. And for that, we must quote the Apostle James, which he mentions three times in his epistle. Faith without works is dead. There could be real faith, but all real faith is not saving faith. Faith, belief, that a man, that someone could do miracles, did not save these people. They could do miracles. And we'll find that it seems that just faith itself in Jesus' name, because if somebody understood the totality of his name, you would. But if you just thought of him as Jesus and his name, but not the true Jesus, then you won't be saved. So let me, let me bring that clear. Okay, we'll find this again later on. So faith must show itself as genuine through the life. That's what it means. Faith without works is dead. Faith, it's faith alone that saves, but faith is never alone. Faith is accompanied by a genuine change of the life. That's works. Works do not contribute to salvation, but it produces. Don't get the cart before the horse. There is salvation first through faith, and then after that, there comes works. If there's no works, there's no fruit, then you don't know what kind of tree it is. Jesus talked about it so many times. That's how you distinguish between who is saved and not saved. So let's look at John chapter 12 and verse 42 and 43. These are people that had faith, but they showed no expression of that faith. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him, pastoral, real faith, believed on Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Let's take this apart a little bit. They believed on him. They had true faith, pastoral. But... That's what's called diversive. But there's some evidence that will come up that casts some doubt on their faith. What is, what is it? The lack of works. What did Jesus say? If you will not confess me before men, I will not also confess you before my Father in heaven. That is clearly an indication that the person has much doubt that he could be saved. Note that. But note also what he said later on loving the praise of men more than the praise of God. So we have two lack of works that evidence salvation here. One is that they did not confess them before men because scared of the Pharisees, of their, of their friends. Plus, they loved the praise of men more than God. Is it possible they could be saved? Could be possible, but very marginal, and I think you would understand that. Look at yet another example of why believing on Jesus must produce works as evidence, as fruit of true salvation. John 8, 30 and 31. And he, Jesus, spake these words. Many believed on him. This is what Jesus said. Many believed on him. And then this is Jesus' words. Then say Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. Pastoral. These are all pastoral. They had genuine belief. The question is the object of their belief. And just what Jesus said. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. If, it's conditional, if ye continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. Jesus is looking for where their heart's at. Belief can be mental. 
Belief can be on the wrong object. Unless the object is in touch with the Savior, there is no salvation. And that, if it's a real salvation, there is a change of the heart. You will follow Jesus because you, you love Jesus. You have a relationship with Jesus. And Jesus himself said that you who will believe on me, if, conditional, if you continue, continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And then Jesus re, re, really reinforces in the parable of the sower. Which I'll mention later on, getting, my, getting ahead of myself again. But discipleship, if you continue my word, then you are my disciples. Jesus made it very clear what discipleship, what being a disciple is. Let's look at it. In Matthew 10, 37, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, not worthy of being my disciple. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, not worthy of his disciple. So those who do not continue in his word cannot be his disciple, and we saw what Jesus means by disciple. And then he said later on, Matthew 16, 24, and 25, if any man, if any person will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. So let's put it together. How do we explain those who believed in Jesus because of his miracles, who believed in his name, but did not follow Jesus' words in discipleship? How do we explain that? Is it contradictory? No, it's not contradictory because they did not deny themselves. That's the cause of discipleship. They did not take up their cross, which is the cause of true discipleship. They did not lose their life for Christ's sake, but saved it. And they love family more than Christ. So it is clear that belief in Christ, in his name, in his miracles, is not saving faith. That's clear. Because it changes the person. Salvation is not found in a word. It's found in the context in which we find the word. It determines the object of the faith. It has to be the Savior. Nothing less than the Savior. And here is the parable of the sower that Jesus described. Those who believed in him, his name, because of miracles, this explained them. Their lack of continuing in his word. But he that receiveth the seed into stony places... The same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it, yet hath he not root himself, but doeth for a while, not continuing his word. Endureth just for a while, not continuing his word. Jesus said what those kind of people are. Those are those who have their hearts that are described as stony ground. Because there's no soil when the seed, when the root of Christ, the gospel, sprouts. It pushes up quickly, but it cannot remain because it's not sourced in the soil. It's prized the nourishment. They're not rooted to Christ. So these who merely believed in his name or because of miracles, but there's no life follow-up, continuing his word, not his disciples, they're just not saved. Those are the words of Christ. Now let me be clear and let scripture speak for itself. Faith in Christ is all that is required. Now look up please. I want you to get this. I am not making an argument that you don't need faith in Christ. I am not making an argument that you need anything in addition to faith in Christ. That's not what I've said. What I've said is the faith must find its objects in Jesus and the faith must be true faith, must be saving faith. And how do we know if it's saving faith, if it changes the heart? Let me be clear. And let Scripture speak for itself. I'll say that again. Faith in Christ is all that is required. Nothing, no addition. This is the Reformation. Faith in Christ alone is all that's required to be saved. Recall the words of Paul to the Philippine jailer. 
Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But let's look a little bit closer at that passage. Let's look at the context. Who is the subject that Paul was speaking to? He was speaking to a man who feared for his life, who feared for judgment, who wanted to be saved. He asked, what must I do to be saved? He was a sinner, and he knew he was guilty, helpless, condemned. We looked at this subject with whom Paul spoke those words. And let's look at the object of the faith of Christ. Jesus pointed, excuse me, Paul pointed the Philippine jailer to Christ. Not to his name, not to his miracles, but to Christ. And if we read the passage further along, not only he was saved, but his house was saved. And it was evidence. The Bible says they, that Paul also ministered to the house, and they welcomed them in the house, and they had a love feast. So there was a change. Very important contextually. Without a doubt, this man was saved. He was a convinced, guilty, helpless sinner whose object of faith was Christ, who had evidence for real faith in his life. It is only faith that you need, but it's faith as a guilty, condemned sinner needing Christ, desperately needing Christ. And the validity and the authenticity of the faith is shown by a changed life. It's not a mental thing we're talking about. It's not a reformation of a religious life that we're talking about. It's not church attendance or even Bible reading or even prayer. It's a changed life. It's a change of the affections. And if you place your faith in Christ, and we're going to go deeper into that. I talked about relationship. This is so heavy. So heavy. True faith in Christ produces conversion, a change. Paul said to the church at Corinth in a second letter, second epistle, Therefore, if any man, if any person may be in Christ, that's worded to designate union, that you have Christ, you have him, you're saved. If any man is saved, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold. Behold. That means, wow, look at that. Look at that. Behold. All things become new. The life changes what a person hated before. The things of God, of Christ, holiness, hate before, now they love. What they loved before, sin in the world, they now hate. It's a radical change, conversion. And that is what true faith produces. Anything short of that is questionable faith. Second, Jesus does not commit himself, and this is heavy, Jesus does not commit himself to those who only mentally believe, mentally believe in him, but do not truly commit themselves to him in heart belief. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them. This is where true belief, true faith in Christ brings about a real vibrant and personal relationship with him. This is heart belief, heart to heart, reflective of receiving real salvation and inheriting eternal life. Now we need to ask ourselves, probably you're thinking already, why would Jesus not commit himself to those who believed in him? Isn't it true that Jesus says, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Absolutely true. Jesus will never turn away anyone who comes to him by faith. But we already saw in the previous passages that many of these people did not come to him in real faith. That faith in a miracle worker, faith in his name, but their life was not changed. So Jesus will never not commit himself to a sinner that needs him and places trust in him. Put it down. That's not what he's talking about. It's deeper than that. You see, this is so important. There's a word play here, and I'll explain what that means, that John is using. When it says here, believed, believed, I told you that's a word, pastool, believed. But the word commit 
that's translated in the King James as commit. Same sense in the ESV and the New American Standard. They say entrust or entrusting. But same idea. So this is what I want you to get. The same word believe is translated commit here and it's perfect. This is what, in essence, Jesus is saying. If they don't really believe in me in the saving way, as I've said, that leads to heart chains, then I will not believe in them. If they do not really commit to me, I'm not going to commit myself to them. If they don't really entrust their life to me, then I'm not going to entrust my life to him or her. Because it's a relationship. And of course, you know this. Relationships are two-way. Isn't that the way you want your relationship? What did, Rome, what did Juliet say to Romeo? Be true. In other words, I want to be able to trust you. I want to be able to believe that when you tell me you love me, that you're not lying to me. That's a relationship. So if you want your sins forgiven, faith in Christ better understood because we use a lot of jargon, even faith. What does it really mean? What does it mean? Is you commit your life as a sinner, as someone who has lost under the power of sin, I commit my life to you, Jesus, as my Savior. Because I need you. You commit to his totality of a person. And then, when that faith is genuine, when that relationship is such that the sinner wants a relationship with Jesus, then I want a relationship with you. That's so important. Relationship must be two ways. It can't just be one way. Jesus is not going to commit himself to people that do not want him. If they want me, then I want them. I've already died for them. I want you to get this. There's no lack of commitment for Jesus. Because even while we were sinners, he still committed himself to die for us. He could, still committed to pursue salvation for us. But in the act of saving, of knowing Jesus, he knows our hearts. That's what this says. He knew what was in all men. So I want you to get that. Jesus did not commit himself to them because they did not commit them. He did, they did not get, commit themselves to him. They didn't want a relationship. They wanted some benefit without the strings attached, without the lordship, without the change of the heart. That's so important. The marriage relationship is patterned ultimately pattern after this mutual trust and commitment. Yes, commitment of the two parties. What would a marriage relationship be like if only one committed? That's no relationship at all. That's no marriage at all. How many people, myself included, when I was young, thought unrequited love was the most tragic thing in the universe? I gave my love to her, but she wouldn't give it to me. See, that's not a relationship. That's fantasy. You get what I'm saying? Loving someone, loving an idol, maybe you're a social media, I love that person. They don't even know who you are. That's not a relationship. A real relationship is commitment. And as we saw, continuing in his work. Continuing commitment. Jesus is committed to you if you come to him for eternity. And if you, the first moment of trust is commitment, and he will give you the strength to commit. Your salvation is not dependent upon your being faithful to Jesus. Because his faithfulness covers it all. He, but he does want that initial trust and need for him. And when his commitment is forever, so much so that the Bible says, and we'll see when we get to Romans, the end of chapter 8, his commitment is so strong that nothing and no one can separate his commitment to us. When you trust him, you can't get, you can't, you can't get away from Jesus. And you wouldn't want to. But I'm saying he is tenacious. He will stick closer than a brother than glue than super glue. Nothing and no one can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So Jesus had no lack of commitment. But the initial commitment as a lost sinner must be real. I need Jesus. I need Jesus and I want him. Point three. 
Jesus does not commit himself to those who have, no, who have deceived themselves into thinking they have no sin and so really have no need for him as their Savior. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew what was in man. First, let us step back for a minute and think, what does it mean he knew what was in man? Jesus is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. He's divine. That's one of his attributes, omniscience, all-knowing. The fact that Jesus possesses omniscience is shown many times, even here in the Gospel of John. Follow me with it if you've been following this. Think about the first disciples. When Andrew brought his, his brother Simon Peter to Jesus, Jesus already knew him. Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming up to him, he said, here is an Israelite indeed with no guile. And then when Nathanael found out that he saw him under the fig tree, he was blown away, omniscience. Jesus also said to his disciples that he knew that Judas was an unbeliever among him. So we know that Jesus is omniscient. But that's a teaching throughout the Bible. We have to set that standard, understand that Jesus knows all things. He doesn't make a mistake. He doesn't, he doesn't say, I'm not going to commit to them, but ooh, I made a mistake. They were committing to me, but I won't commit to them. No, that will not happen. So we need to understand that Jesus is spot on. He knows all things. He doesn't make a mistake. We make mistakes. We do sins. But Jesus makes no mistakes. That's a teaching taught throughout the Old and New Testaments that both God the Father and God the Son are omniscient. God the Holy Spirit too, but we're focusing on God the Father and God the Son. In 1 Kings 8-39, just listen. Thou only knowest the hearts of all the children of men. Thou only knowest. The prophet said, only you know the hearts of the children of men. And in the New, the New Testament, in Hebrews 4-13, the writer of Hebrews said, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Friends, we all have to do with God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to do with him. And he sees us. We are naked. We can't cover up our sins. So God and the Lord Jesus Christ knows our heart, our mind. We can't hide. We need to just put it down not try to pretend. We can deceive men and women. We can deceive even wife or husband. We can deceive children and our family members, but we can't deceive God. We should not try to deceive anyone, but we should know very clearly that Jesus, Lord and God himself, knows our hearts, so we should be open to what is in our heart. But the person who is most deceived the person who's most deceived is ourselves. That's so important that you understand that. A real Christian who knows their Bible, they will know that I can't trust myself. Because if you trust yourself, why do I have to trust in the Lord with all my heart? And lean not unto my own understanding. Hey, uh, you know what? I, I know the Bible. And, you know, I already know what to do. No, no, no. A Christian never, never trusts in ourselves. We know it all too plain. We've made too many sins and, and bad choices of which we had to pay, which God has shown us. And so, who is the most deceptive person that you know? The answer should be me. All of us should say me. It's me that I cannot trust. And the Bible says that in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is, des is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked, who can know it? And we are the least to know our hearts. I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about myself. We can easily deceive ourselves. And we don't see our terribly wicked heart because we, out of pride, don't want to look at it. I'm not saying that that's how Christian is all the time, but we can be certainly in that way if we're not in a good place with God. We can deceive ourselves thinking that we're okay when we're not. But Jesus sees our deceitful heart. Whether we're lost or saved, Jesus sees our deceitful heart. Jesus sees that 
we're happy with our life, not really fully committed to him. Jesus sees our wicked heart. And he will not commit himself to us in salvation unless we commit himself to him. But he is committed that you will be saved. If you do not have the sense of your sin and needing Christ and committing your life to Christ, having real faith, then you will not be saved because you need to be convinced you're a sinner in need of Christ. When you, when you are and you commit yourself to Christ, he will commit himself to you. But even if you're not at that place, he is still committed that you become saved. That's why you're here tonight. He hasn't given up on you. Even in your sin, he still speaks to you. But you need to think about the reality of who you are. And I want you to think of what the prophet Isaiah spoke to those who thought that they were not sinners, that they did not really need forgiveness. They were okay. I'm just a normal Joe. I'm just a normal Mary. And I don't really need to be saved. I'm okay the way I am. And so the prophet Isaiah speaks to you if that is your thought. And he said this, Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord. And their works are in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us? And who knoweth us? Now I want you to be honest. Do you really think that God is looking at your life? Does it disturb you that God sees your deceitful heart, sees your sin? Does it trouble you? Do you go sleepless nights thinking that all God looks at me, he sees filth and dirt, and I feel so disgusted with myself. I am so unworthy, and I need my sins forgiven. Or do you gloss it over? Oh, you know, I'm not any worse than anyone else. Yeah, I've done the sin, but who hasn't? Oh, these are just mistakes. No one's perfect. And so you hide over them, gloss over them. And so you don't deal with the God who demands holiness. You see, Jesus sees all of your dark sins. You can't deceive him. You can't trick him. But even though you try to trick God and the Lord Jesus Christ, he has not taken away. He will not continue to offer you salvation because he's committed that you come to the place where you are disgusted with yourself, where you see that your life without God is empty and hopeless. When you come to grips with your sin, when you come to grips that you're not okay, that you're searching, you're searching for a relationship that doesn't satisfy, but Jesus satisfies. He is and represents, and the relationship we have with him as Christians, is the deepest, is the most intimate, is the most trustworthy relationship that one can ever have. Relationship with the one who died for you, with the one who was tortured for you, with the one who, even though you have refused him many, many times, still he comes back for you. The Bible even talks about it like you cheated on him and still he called you back. You were like a proverbial whore against him, yet he still calls you back. You tell me you can find someone like that under heaven. Will you betray someone? Will you cheat on someone? And still they love you and they're committed to you and they will not lose their commitment to you. Never, never lose their commitment to you because they are committed to love you and to keep you, and to cherish you, and to make sure you have joy unspeakable and full of glory. When you know Jesus, you have the most profound, the most beautiful, the most heavenly relationship. And that's your inner need. See, that's the inner need of us all. All of us are lonely for God. You didn't know that. And you're trying to find a cheap substitute. I'm not saying that a marriage relationship is not good and fulfilling. It is. It's great. Or with a boyfriend or girlfriend, that could be very nice. But you know as well as I do that no matter how good your husband or your wife is, and I'm not talking about extramarital affairs. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about 
always, always being there for you. Always being there for you. Never losing their clasp on you. You never looking less beautiful today that they don't love you so much today. You see, we have nothing with which to be loved. We are sinners, and yet Jesus loves us. He's passionate about us. He will never let us go. So if you do not know Jesus, you need to know him. Even though you are filthy in sin, he will receive you. If you commit your life to him because you need him, then he will commit himself to you forever and ever. That is what salvation is all about. It's not about religious words. It's about being fulfilled in your life, knowing God through the personal relationship that is the most perfect and fulfilling relationship that there is through Jesus Christ. We betrayed him. We sinned against him. Yet, he still holds us fast. So come as a condemned guilty sinner. You, you know. Friends, you know you're a sinner. What are you scared of? I've already disarmed the relationship. All you can look forward to is forgiveness. Jesus doesn't want you to be unhappy. Jesus doesn't say, if you become a Christian, that you can't have any fun, that you can't... There's many things that you do in your life that maybe you think is wrong. Maybe they're not wrong. And you think in your mind, or maybe the devil has told you, if I become a Christian, I'll have no fun. If I become a Christian, I can't do that. Or have to do this. Uh, it would be unpleasant. And I don't know if I want to do that. What is real to me is this life. Yeah, okay, I should be concerned about eternity. But right now, I'm not concerned about eternity. But Jesus is in the here and now also. He will give you eternal life now. Forgiveness of sins now. Intimate relationship now. He wants you to have joy and pleasures forevermore. You need Jesus Turn from your life of sin and selfishness. Come to Christ. And as Brother Jack Leofield said this morning, there is no one who regrets coming to Jesus. No one. I want you to think about that. That's not true of any other endeavor, any other occupation, any other arrangement, any other relationship. But if you come to Jesus and you're saved, your whole eyes will be open. And you said, I, you would think, I have never lived before until coming to Jesus. I'm not giving you highfalutin words. This is reality. This is our testimony. This is all of our testimonies. You talk to us, and we will boast on Jesus. This is our prayer for you. Please stand. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the love of Jesus Lord, how he wants to commit himself to the life of every lost person here. And he's just waiting for them to commit themselves to him that he might save them. Lord, disarm them from any thought of not trusting Jesus, whatever it may be. Whatever thought they have about being a Christian that's unpleasant, take that away. Take that lie away. Show them that the way that they're going about their life will not fulfill them, will not Make them content. They've never entered a relationship in their whole life where they can experience the commitment, the shared commitment that Jesus will give to them forever, no matter what. They can't do anything wrong that would cause Jesus to turn away from them. So help someone tonight who has not trusted Jesus to come to him, just to give their life to him, knowing that you will preserve it, you will that he will take care of it. He will love them forever. He will cleanse them, purify them, beautify them, give them joy, and sp joy unspeakable. They will see the reason why you sent Jesus so they can have a fulfilled life. Lord, do all these things, God. Bless the food that we're about to receive in our fellowship as well. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.